All right. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome on in. This is Thinkful's webinar, Four Principles to Learn to Code Fast. Uh, we'll start off with some very brief introductions. Uh, first, myself. My name is Dodge McIntosh. I will be kind of monitoring and moderating, rather, our webinar session tonight. Um, I'm a Thinkful mentor uh, on the data science side of things, based here in San Diego, California. Uh, I've been teaching data science and machine learning courses for about a year and a half now. I've been with Thinkful since the beginning of this year. Before getting into the data science field and kind of that data field at large, I had pretty much no programming experience also. <laughs> so for those of you out there who are going, yeah, I've got little to no experience and I'm looking to make that big career change or at least learn a handful of new skills, just know that it's possible from whatever background you're coming in with. Uh, I always like to tell other people that other humans have learned how to use these tools and techniques. If you're a human, you can too. Um, I also am a former boot camp graduate myself, so happy to answer any questions about the boot camp experience from that personal perspective. Uh, it can be challenging at times, right? It's a lot of information compressed into a very short amount of time, which is the crux of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but yeah, happy to answer any of those questions as well. One last brief note on my introduction is I'll go ahead and just post a couple different ways that you can connect with me right there in the chat. First off, uh, my LinkedIn and my email. If you'd like to connect and uh, want to keep the conversation going, compare notes after we wrap up, very happy to do that. Those are the two best ways. Uh, so that's me, enough about me. Uh, here now to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, our very special guest, Mr. Jason Humphrey. Uh, so Jason's a principal software engineer at Fidelity, and he's the founder of Coding Career Fastlane helping developers achieve success through all stages of their careers. Uh, if you wanna connect with Jason, you can find him on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. All of those links are right there in the reference sheet. Uh, so welcome on in, Jason. Uh, great to have you joining us here tonight. Thank you, Ple pleasure to be here. <laughs> awesome. So I just did a very, very brief intro for you. Uh, by no means doing your career path justice. Uh, so I'm wondering if for the fine people out there, you could share a little bit more in depth about your background and about kind of the journey that's brought you to where you are today. Yeah, sure thing. I'll give you definitely some about that. Um, and as I get started, uh, if you guys are ever curious, have any curious curiousness into uh, data science events, I highly encourage you to check out of one of out one of Dodge's events. He is one of he is our best data science mentor here and he gets rave reviews. So if you're ever interested, I, I encourage you to go to one of his, his <laughs> events for sure. Um, oh, so, and, and spoiler alert, I'll I'll echo that back right <laughs> up to, to Jason for for the uh, the software engineering side of oh, things. Oh thank you. <laughs> um, all right so how I got to where I am today a little bit of background for you guys uh, Fun, fun story I got out of, uh, actually, I went to college for computer science. I was not a self-taught person, and I wasn't a technical boot camp person, but I feel as though I am, and I'll tell you why here. I got out of college. I wasn't actually finding a job. I was not a good developer. My university did me no justice. I love my alma mater and all, but they really did not help me with getting a job. They didn't technically teach me enough at all, and I was fortunate enough it was who I knew that helped me get the job to start at Fidelity. And they got me into a post-grad program that Fidelity has and still has to this day called the LEAP program. And what it is is you go to Raleigh, North Carolina for six months. They do two months of heavy intensive training. Uh, did And then they did uh, four months of a project-based type learning and to put it simply, uh, I was in the research triangle with a bunch of really smart developers. They hired 180 people. And I tell you, no lie, I was the worst one there. I took remedial Java twice. Now, when I say rem when I was in the research triangle with a bunch of smart people, let me show you. I was I was say, there, and, and with remedial Java too, could you unpack like that? Yeah, for, for yes, all of this. Yes, Sorry, I can. I mean, let me unpack the whole thing then with this. Uh, so the research triangle is Duke University, UNC and NC State, three of the most prestigious colleges in that area, and they pump out highly qualified developers. I was not one of them. And so when we talk about remedial Java, uh, 
when you join this post grad program, they in the two months training, they every week is something new. They teach you, they teach you, they teach you, and they expected everyone to learn Java as a computer science person. Well, I didn't, and they give tests at the end of these, and I failed it two weeks in a row, and they made me stay out after for one to two hours every day after work to the point where I thought I was going to get fired for sure. I was like, oh, there's no way they're going to keep me. Like, oh, I got to keep my head down, keep going, because I will get fired. Luckily, as you see to this day, I am not because I'm still working at Fidelity. Uh, but that's what I mean by I literally had to spend hours after work trying to relearn the stuff that everybody already moved on from and everybody already knew. And so I think it's fair to say I was probably the worst developer there because I was the only one taking rem remedial Java twice. I had some people the first time retake it with me. Got some classes in that, around, I was the only one there. around. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of where I started my career. They moved me out to Texas. I, in the beginning of my career, thought I was kind of owed something I wasn't. Like, I thought I was just deserving of raises. I thought I was deserving of a developer. Like, oh, they're just going to promote me. I'm just going to get these things. I'm going to get it. I did terrible for my first three years. I didn't know what it took. Like, I was still bad. And I thought at the same time, like, oh, me documenting stuff and me maybe learning a little bit and helping out drove value. And it didn't. Because I learned, I watched all my peers get promotions, get raises. And... I'm sitting there, you know, three years into an associate position, and this was not normal. Most of the peer, my peers got jobs. Remember, 180 of us graduated at the same time. So I have 180 people to compare to. And all of them were getting promoted. I was the last one to get promoted out of my class. And at the time, right before I got promoted, I started to learn what value, how to learn and drive value from my mentors. I finally got a mentor. I kind of had an epiphany moment. And I took off from there. And I took off because of some of the stuff I'm going to teach you tonight that it's not just like when we say learn to code faster, it's it's not just you you hit the keyboard harder. There's there's got to be strategy behind it. And when you learn your strategy and you figure out your time management and you figure out what it takes for you to learn, you can kill it. And that's kind of like the catalyst. This isn't, this isn't w, WPMs we're talking about here, right? Exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, the faster you type, no, it, you could, yeah. It, so this was that catalyst point. This is where you're going to learn some of the things at this point in my career that was very pivotal. Because at that point, after three years, the next three years were a complete turnaround. I got three promotions in three years to ultimately now leading a team of eight developers where I actually manage them and I'm the lead developer on the team. So uh, it's been a, quite a change around. There's lots of things I learned. I'm going to show you lots of that tonight. But that's kind of where the story went from that catalyst moment to where I am now. There's, there's a lot in between there and we'll get to some of that tonight. But that's kind of that's where we're at now. And I actually moved from DFW. So shout out to my DFW people. And I moved to Boston. Shout out to the Boston people as well. Uh, but that's kind of where we are. Let me know what questions does that leave us with, Dodge? Yeah, yeah. And so for if you could also just kind of give a sense of about how long ago was this compared to, to where we are today? Because um, we're talking about kind of the first three years of of maybe like things aren't clicking and there, there needed to be that big snap transition. Um, how long ago was that compared to today? That was about 2015. So about four years ago now, four, four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, uh, and actually that's when I had started uh, also mentoring at Thinkful. Actually, when I was, when I just started turning around, I just started to get uh, my feet on the ground as a developer. And that, that, let's be clear, that took me the two to three years to get my feet on the ground, I feel like, like actually stability under me. And uh, that's also when I started helping out at Thinkful. Nice. And then just as a, as a quick kind of also side note on that, you talked about having somebody that you were able to, to learn from, having that kind of mentoring role for you in that space. Was that mentor somebody who was somebody uh, more senior at Fidelity mm -hmm. or was it somebody, another developer at a different company, but somebody, a colleague that you knew? So, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, in the beginning, it was kind of one person that kind of got it started. Mm -hmm. But I realized very quickly that there was no such thing as a limit of mentors. You can be mentored by anyone just by asking them the right questions. And so I ended up getting a lot of different mentors, some in Fidelity, uh, some outside uh, in the industry, uh, some people that were in my own family. I found at that time, I went from zero mentors to oh, one mentor to like six or seven mentors that I had that kind of mentored me in all different aspects of uh, of coding. Yeah. Really. Awesome. Well, yeah. So I would love to, to just kind of jump right in here. Um, obviously, 
there was you know some big things that that started to click some some big takeaways um and i guess maybe for if you could just share one of those kind of things to look out for for people who maybe they've picked up a little bit of coding but they're they're trying to look out there uh in the space yep. one a high level tip or trick to to take away um you know maybe if there's something that you saw again and again yes so perfect perfect yeah i and that is actually what i consider to be i say i want to teach you guys tonight patterns uh so when and this also probably if this resonates with you you're, you potentially are getting some coding challenges uh you potentially are getting interviewed doing mock interviews this is going to really hit home with you um but some things i saw early on were patterns and i wasn't even very early on it was more to that that two to three year mark i started seeing what i was missing all along which was what I like to call patterns. And this is what I mean in programming, because truth be told, programming is nothing more than the same pattern repeated over and over and over. And all that's changing is the different business logic in between the patterns or even in the patterns then. So what am I talking about when I say patterns? This is what I'm getting at. So it's, it's generally your basic language constructs patterns of when you get a problem, you're gonna see the same things over and over. Prime example, uh, you'll see for loops, while loops, switch statements, comparisons, operators, recursion, Lots of different things you could see in patterns. Let me get a little more specific. Uh, like fundamentals of your language show up in the problems you answer daily. Calculate, like, like let's say you get this problem. Calculate the sum of all the numbers in an array. Truth be told there, the pattern is really a for loop with a variable counter. And if you do some other similar problems, you're gonna also notice sometimes it's a for loop with a variable counter. Uh, another popular challenge you guys have probably heard of is the FizzBuzz challenge, right? All that is, is you have a variable that checks the difference, and then you have a switch statement. And it sounds a lot bigger and harder, but when you break down your problems, you're getting into the patterns you know you need to have, whether it's, oh, I need to loop over something. Oh, I need to have a count variable. Oh, I need to have a difference variable. Oh, I need a switch statement, a while loop. Patterns are absolutely key. And what I learned on early in my career that I was missing because what I saw was I would do one piece of work here, or I would go learn one little piece of information over here and one little bit over here. And I wasn't really connecting the dots. It was just like, uh, I was trying all these things out and I was like, oh, I can kind of do this. Yeah. And what I've even noticed recently- On the individual, like, individual basis there. Yeah, exactly. And what I've really noticed actually recently with a lot of students I've had to help out and teach some of this too, is also as you're learning to code, where I see people go wrong here is they do the same thing where I was doing was they, you pick a piece here, like you do one problem with objects, you do one with arrays, you do one with language fundamentals, you do one, like you're all over the place. And until you actually practice enough in one area, you're not gonna see the patterns. You're gonna see a little bit of this and go, oh, that's cool. Go over here and you see something totally new and you go, oh, that's cool. And you're over here now and you see something totally different. It's like, okay. How do we connect the dots? And this is where I've got a couple things for you to actually do that. Uh, would you like me to give some actual items, Dodge? Yeah, re real quick. One note on, on this piece is, um, I know one of the things that you hear when you're just starting to learn out there is you go, okay, hammered in the importance of knowing how to ask the right questions, right? And knowing how to Google those different problems or at least look for different examples. Uh, and one of the things that I think can be misconstrued there is that that will always be like the solution to all your problems when really it's it's a, an important tool to have in your toolkit but you also do want to start to be even if you're not memorizing every single parameter and every single function out there being able to identify these patterns as part of that overall structure that framework right where one off different things are going to be different but internalizing some of that framework that you can start to lay these problems on top of you know, it's um, you, with you saying that, um, I've actually had a couple, I literally, someone came up to me recently and was all freaking out and worried. They're like, I got to memorize everything. <laughs> Truth be told, you really, you don't. Cause when you, when you start seeing the patterns and you practice enough, it becomes second nature to where it's not really that you spent the time to memorize it. It's, it becomes muscle memory. Mm -hmm. There's not really much memorization in, in muscle memory. It's, it's second nature. So yeah. I wouldn't even have to, you, that way you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, it's like when you're practicing kind of any new skill, right? Whether that's some athletic thing or playing a musical instrument or 
you know, there's always going to be so many different variations within that skill, within that performance that you can't memorize every single piece of those. But if you have the fundamentals of that sport, or if you've done your scales on the musical instrument, you'll be able to build from that foundation when you see those new instances and those new, uh, those new scenarios. Um, but yeah, and so Stacy right here in the chat actually asked a great question that I think tees up some of those things that we we're talking about for uh, for those practices, right? For some of the ways to to kind of dig into this patterns piece in a tangible way. So let's let's jump on into it. So I've got three things I always like to say to people to start practicing this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, to make sure you go over and reattempt old problems that you couldn't solve uh and try to uh figure out the pattern like try to like before you actually go in and solve resolve the whole problems you couldn't solve try to figure out the patterns ahead of time by pseudo coding and actually writing down what you think you have to do and figure that out first that's the first one um and people don't always have as many problems as they want uh in front of them so what i say next is okay let's go break down old problems you already did solve and let's figure out the patterns in what you've already done in the past and let's go for those that's number two and number three is then Get on a site like Edibit and practice the same problem five times in a row at a minimum. And truth be told, if you were practicing five times in a row, go up in levels because something like an Edibit, which is a great site, you just pick a problem, pick a tag, and pick a level. And you can practice it five to six, seven times in a row. And you pick with a tag like, oh, I just want to work on arrays. Oh, I just want to work on objects. Oh, I just want to work on language fundamentals. They have over 4,500 problems. And that's a really great place, place to practice while you're learning to code to do things five, six, seven times in a row and they've gamified it. Now, that's not the only website, there's lots of other ones, uh, but that is one of the ones I recommend because it's easiest to just pick a tag and pick an area to stick inside. And because what you'll notice when you start working a lot of math problems is, or especially with arrays and some type of math and array problems, more often than not, you're dealing with either a for loop or a nested for loop. It, it The patterns are <laughs> gonna show up like crazy after you start doing this stuff so many times in a row. Now, one question I wanna answer that I know I'll probably get is, okay, why does this work? And this kind of goes to like what you were saying, Dodge, with like sports and stuff, but let me give it to another way. Your brain thinks in patterns already. So I know like when I say, oh, patterns, 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 that, that's kind of vague, but you know patterns like the back of your hand. You know when you go up to a green light, what does green mean, what does red mean? You know the pattern. You mean, oh, that means go and this means stop, right? Uh, also, you know uh, when uh, you've seen a problem uh, that asks for a list of something, you generally know that means an array too. So like there's these patterns you already know that you just have to start breaking down. I can't just sit here and give you all of them because it's how you internalize this information, truth be told. And that's where if you just focus on these areas, that's one of the things you'll pick up and start noticing this stuff uh, and it will sink in a lot faster. And I'll, even later in this webinar, uh, me and Dodge will talk about some ways to even really take that information and really sink it in and make it really concrete for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I had a quick, uh, somebody chatted me. So you can chat uh, privately, by the way, in webinars here. Uh, if you have a general question or one for the chat, make sure that you're, you're posting it in the public uh, or posting it in that Q&A. Uh, somebody did give me a nice reminder here on a logistics housekeeping note that I forgot to mention earlier. They're asking, is this going to be recorded? Uh, and yes, our session today is going to be recorded. You will get a link emailed to you after we wrap up this, uh, this session, and that'll just get emailed to the same email that you signed up with. Um, so yes, uh, ideally, um, or hopefully that, that clears that up as well. Um, Wonderful. So yeah, kind of jumping off of that point that we were talking about. And there's another question here in the Q&A bar that I think um, is a nice place to, to flow from here. So Tara was asking, what's the best way to practice when you're in a boot camp, trying to keep up with the material? You don't have a lot of time. Uh, I think this actually gives us a really good foundation to, to join in from. Um, Oh, and really quick here. Oh, sorry, there in the chat. Uh, so for Jason uh, with the, the raised hand there, um, sorry, not ignoring those raised hands. Uh, if there is a specific question, uh, please post those in the Q&A bar. Um, Want to make sure that we have an opportunity for everybody to check out what, uh, what those questions are. Um, yeah, 
want to make sure that we've got that. And if it is a quick private issue, you can totally feel free uh, to private chat me as well. All right, wonderful. Um, so yeah, that questionnaire about the best way to keep practicing when you're in that boot camp, trying to keep up with material, and you don't have a lot of time. Um, even before we get to those ways to keep practicing, I think we have some foundational stuff that we need to set up before that, right? We need to, to kind of build this baseline, build this framework, uh, and try to then after that, then we can start practicing in, in the most effective ways. Um, so let's get into that foundation part. Uh, if we are trying to figure out how to practice in a limited amount of time, I think we probably need to start with understanding what time we're working with, right? Oh, couldn't agree more. Um, and remind me about this after we get to this allocation part to specifically answer that person's question. Who was it who asked the question? Um, yeah, so that was uh, Tara there. Tara, there. Tara, I will, and you guys keep me honest, remind me to make sure I don't forget this. Remind me to explain a knowledge guide at the end because that'll also help with the time allocation. We add that on top and I'll, I'll, I'll help you give, get a way to make sure you're studying and trying to hold on to more of this information. Cause I know being in a boot camp, right? It's a lot. You are, you are cramming a lot in, in, uh, six months. Um, oh, by the way, uh, when I was saying I felt like a boot camp student earlier myself, even though I wasn't technically one, that postgrad program at Fidelity was basically a boot camp. Now looking <laughs> yeah. back, like that's yeah. legitimately what it was. <laughs> Um, you're like, oh yeah, with just like a, a tiny bit of like hindsight on it, you're like this was totally a boot camp experience. Yeah. It really was, and it really showed me that's all I needed. I didn't need four years, yeah, uh, in lots of debt to get that, but I did. So moving on, I digress. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's talk about how where to allocate time because this is something, as Dodge was saying, that's absolutely key to know. I like to teach people there's five areas you need to make sure you're spending your time, and some of this seems really like. Duh. And other of it's like, wait, why? And so I want to teach you the five areas uh, right now that you need to spend your time. And the first is, and this sounds funny, but I'm serious, asking for help. Like, what do you mean I need to spend my time asking for help? Yeah. You need to spend your time on Stack Overflow. You need to spend your time talking to your mentor. You need to spend your time talking to peers. If you don't have peers, find a network, find people, find different groups. Um, and that's uh, find somewhere to ask your questions because you're going to have them. And if you're not asking them, it's going to only hold you back. And so you mm -hmm. cannot let this hold you back. You have to have somewhere to go when you can't answer that question. And that's why I always advocate for mentors is because that's kind of where you see this catalyst in my career was I had seven, eight people to go to where whether it was a salary negotiation, whether it was a coding question, whether it was a career question, what, whatever it might have been, I had somewhere to go because that's your ceiling. And the only way to raise your ceiling is having people to talk to. So first is asking for help. The second area you should really be spending your time on in these boot camps is boot camp or is in the content they're giving you. Whether it's text based, whether it's video based, uh, whether it's uh, however they, whether it's class, make sure you're spending your time there. Now within these boot camps, most of this is curated, most of this is set in stone. But if you're not learning something some way, like some people don't like reading through a curriculum, great. Make sure you're finding content around that boot camp material that maybe sits, suits you better if it's videos or whatnot. But just make sure you're spending time around what the content wants. The third is your portfolio. So if you're not asking for help and you're not reading content and you know what to do in your portfolio, if you're going to build something, build it to the highest level quality you can. Because someday if your resume comes down my door and you want a job on my team, by the way, I've hired three boot camp students, uh, then it better have a damn good portfolio that Yes, I like to see the story, but at the same time, I don't like to see sloppy pro like projects. So whatever you, when you focus on any project you do, make sure it's good enough to be in your portfolio. And so the fourth is reviewing. Make sure you spend a, a bit of time reviewing. And I like to tell people at the end of the day, you'll hear about this potentially in a little bit too more, but reviewing what you do every single day and at the end of every week. Because the more you review and the more you prepare, the better you'll be. And last but not least, allocate your time in teaching. Teaching what you've learned, and we're going to cover this in a bit with how to learn better, uh, but make sure you allocate time to teach, whether it's teaching one of your peers, whether it's teaching someone on Stack Overflow, whether it's teaching your dog, your wife, your significant other, uh, teaching. 
Now, those are the five areas I like to say to allocate time because if you just allocate over the next six months all your time here from when you're working on the boot camp, that is, uh, that is where I've seen those areas produce the most results. Yes, there's other places to spend time. There's other things you can be doing, but these are the most effective to make sure you're hunkering down and doing these things. Yeah, and I and and these these tackle just tons of different aspects of that being successful in the space, right? From making sure not only that you're understanding it, but also ultimately that you're building out that proof of understanding with that portfolio piece, right? It's yeah. a lot of people can say that they know JavaScript or that they know whatever skill that they're working on. But it's really being able to point to those portfolio projects and say, hey, I can actually prove that I can do what I'm saying that I can do. And you can ask me questions about that to objectively verify if that's true or not, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, is there any, as, as kind of you've worked with students in, in this part of that allocation of time, is there any that you found that are like, people are, are more surprised about or that's kind of one that, commonly is like a, an early miss where you find people it's something that you really need to introduce where they had taken it for granted before? Yes. Um, and like I point to like, I'll, I'll pick one, but I'd like to say first that asking for help's a really a general one like, that always generally shows up that people aren't doing or mm -hmm. the portfolio part and the reviewing part and the teaching. The content one people get and do. Mm -hmm. The other four I'd say all the time but if I had to pick one, one that kind of is the catalyst for a lot of stuff is learning how to ask for help and not just ask for help, but learn how to ask the right questions. Because I'm serious when I say your ceiling is to what you can solve. Mm -hmm. And if you get hit with a problem you can't solve on your own and you don't have a network or don't know how to ask questions to solve that problem, your ceiling can't be raised. And ultimately, there's a level of to get the job as a junior dev, your ceiling has to be so high. And if we can't raise your ceiling to that high, like height enough, then that's where our problems generally arise. And if we take that for granted, we can't crank the ceiling up high enough to <laughs> get you to a job. But if we can teach you these things and you're open to it and you learn how to be resourceful, you learn how to ask for help, because as you ask for more help, you're going to become a better problem solver. You're going to see the patterns. You're going to learn things from people. And then ultimately, then you'll teach it back. And you'll learn what I'm talking about now when I say it becomes a full circle later <laughs> on. Yeah. And asking, right, learning how to ask those right questions. Well, a part of that component has is building out that understanding of patterns, right? Where you're like, okay, as I start to learn, and, and it's, and that's kind of almost becomes one of those chicken or egg things, right? Where you're like, okay, I'm learning how to ask these right questions better. Well, that means that I started to identify these patterns a little bit better. And also then, because I can ask these questions, well, now I can learn more about, I can ask other people about these patterns and ways to further my knowledge or my understanding of that. Oh yeah, you got yeah. it. And then even then you can ask your mentor, then the better you get at these questions like you're talking about, you can ask your mentor harder questions or yep. your peers harder questions. The harder questions you ask, the better answers you're gonna get, the better developer you're gonna be. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so I guess we can move kind of a little bit jumping off of that point where, we know these these big important bins where we're going to be allocating our time. Um, I guess can we dive down a little bit more into Tara's question there? Where best practices for maybe allocating or not allocating, but evaluating how you're spending your time and making sure that you're that you're dedicating enough to those appropriate bins there. Yeah. Oh, we totally can. So I like. Um, I'm going to bring up something on the screen here in a minute. And uh, I said the knowledge guy, but I'll say the knowledge guy because it's going to make more sense to talk about it, I think, later. So make sure, Tara, you said Tara, right? Mm -hmm. Tara, make sure you remember to ask me later about the knowledge guy because it's something I want to make sure you know how to do before you leave here. It's nothing too crazy, but it's impactful, and you'll see why later on. Um, and then um, real quick, for some of those other questions that are I, – I do see those questions coming in there. Um, trust me, promise, we're not ignoring those. A lot of them are kind of more personal choice ones that I think are really cool, really important ones for us to get into, but might fit in better during our open Q&A yeah. part. So for everybody out there, uh, I promise we, we see those and we will get to them. Um, but yeah, I want to keep drilling into this, uh, this kind of evaluating our time piece here. All right. So into the evaluation part, but we'll talk knowledge guy and some of those other questions a bit later. 
So there was one mentor um, specifically I could think back to. Uh, he was a very, he was a higher up, took very good care of me, always took me under his wing. I was fortunate enough to learn some really great things from him. And one of the simplest lessons he ever taught me was probably one of the most profound and most, it literally was this simple and I'm about to show you, but it had the most impact because until I physically saw it, I didn't realize a damn thing about where my time was being spent. Like I thought I knew, I didn't know. And so when we talked just a minute ago about like the five areas, well, I want like, I want you to take those and then now let's evaluate this with your time. And so I've got some general questions. So if you have a piece of paper or you have some answers to this, uh, write them down. Like, let's just start tallying up the numbers as I go through these, because I always like to hear the answers at the end of this. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, and this how, so when we evaluate this time, this little trick, this little technique is we're going to get out a piece of paper, make a grid out of it in a second. And I'm going to show you on the screen physically, but till then, I want you to answer these questions and write down the numbers because we're going to add them up at the end. He started, this mentor started with, okay, Jason, let's, let's look at your time and what you're doing on a daily basis or what, what do you want to be doing? But yeah, let's start there. Um, and so he would ask me, and I'm going to curtail this to our story tonight because we're much more boot camp focused. Uh, so how much time do you want to spend on your boot camp content a day? And I generally hear anywhere from three to four hours on this. And the next question I'll ask, okay, how much time do you want to spend on your bootcamp projects per day, right? You spend a bit of time learning, you want to spend some time on the projects now. I hear, I hear anywhere from one to two hours at this question. And then I also ask, okay, you know, we've talked about allocating time to review. Oh yeah, I want to, I want to review for one hour a day. And oh, you want to spend time with your mentor? Yeah, let's say every other day, or let's just put an hour for now. And oh, do you want to ask questions to your, how much time do you want to spend with your networker you know, building rapport with people, networking, communicating, Slack, like this stuff takes time. And a lot of people will tell me an hour. And then I say, okay, well, how much time with your significant other? And I get anywhere from three to four hours, which is like normal, right? You want to spend a couple hours with your family uh, or your dog even. And then how much me time do you want a day? I hear anywhere uh, two to, whoa, well, two to three hours, maybe one to two, one to three even. And then I hear, and then I ask the question, these last three are some of the most important. How much sleep do you want to get a day? <laughs> Average is about eight. Mm -hmm. And then I ask, okay, how much time do you want to spend at your job? Or how much time do you got to work at your job? Eight hours is what I generally hear as well. And they say, okay, and last question is, how much time do you have to travel between your job and everything else? And I hear about an hour. And something you probably noticed as we got to the end of that is, wait, I don't have 24 hours. This is over 24 hours. And actually the ones I just talked through are pretty standard. More often than not, when people do this and they do this numbers with me at the end, and I'm curious to see in the chat, what numbers did you get to? Because the ones I just rattle off equal 32 hours out of 24 in a day. Uh, so for everybody, yeah, definitely share, share those through. Um, yeah. J Jason walked me through this and, and I was like, Oh yeah, mine for sure. When I was looking through this for, for myself for back in my bootcamp experience, I, if I had done this, I would have been like, oh my God, I would have been, you know, 35, 36. And it's just not, not really possible. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so definitely looking forward to, to seeing what people have to share there in the chat. So, and that's why I loved it. And this lesson was so simple, but I want to show you now how to take this and let's actually put it into a chart and then actually evaluate, you no, know, really how much time do we truly have and where do we physically see it and want to spend it? So I'm going to share my screen now with this. All right, and let's see here. It should just share screen, second screen. Can we see this grid system, right? Oh, James, good. So James, I see James put 22. Well, James, if you put 22, there are not many people out there that get under 24. So you have time to spare then. That's <laughs> lucky for you. But So this is where the rest of the lesson is going to go for this part of the lesson is I want you to make a grid system. Now, I couldn't, uh, I for, from a sharing perspective, uh, you'll notice I only have 12 to 12, uh, but technically I have all 24 you're going to see over the next slides. You don't have to go write it out just like this, but later after we get off tonight, this is what I want you to do is to make a little grid system like this. And this is actually how I like to teach it as I take it another step. I like to actually block it off and say, all right, 
And I love see see I see a bunch of thirties coming yeah, in. Yeah, I was gonna say we've got some we've got some numbers rolling in. This here. is legitimately what ha- this is this is what happened to me, guys. This is you are not alone, James. You are very fortunate. The rest of you, you were just like me. Um, this is what happened to me because this mentor showed me this, and he's like, okay, he's like, but we're not done there. I'm gonna push you a little bit harder on this. I want you to put this down in a grid system. Um, so in the grid system, we put okay. I put you know. From 12, but this is what I want you to do now, not just put the time you wanted. We're going to be realistic now about our time. And so you take your 12 to 7 or maybe 8 a.m. And this is when you want to sleep, right? This is when you're going to get your eight hours. And let's say when you wake up in the morning, you want the me time. But then at 9 o'clock, you got to go to work. Work goes till about, yeah, what is that, 4 or 5 o'clock? But you realize here, if you want to go back to sleep at 11 to get your eight hours, we don't have much time. We got to be very strict and to the point. And we realize now we only have from 5 to 11. And we need to fit in reviewing. We need to fit in family. We need to fit in our mentor and our content. And now you're realizing here at this point, well, maybe we don't have all of our, we don't have all the five points from the previous part we were talking about, you know, the mm-hmm. uh, the teaching or the teaching, the reviewing, all five of the allocations I was talking about before. You can substitute things out throughout the week if you really need to. Uh, and move things around. But I want you to block off the time when you can actually sit down and work. Uh, The times when you actually can sit down and talk with your mentor, the times when you actually spend time with your family, because it's not like people just think you just come here, hammer out code, you're going to get it. No, you still have to focus on yourself because if you're not happy and you're not getting quality time with family and you're not like keeping that balance of life, well, Mm -hmm. things get hard very quickly and it's hard to make it past the first or second month. Yeah, uh, but that, that, that burnout, is. that burnout happened. It's a yes. real, it's a real concern. Yeah. Yes, it is. And so when you look at something like this, one of the things I like to say is, uh, one of the things I like to do is, okay, how can we optimize this now that we can see this? I generally pull out me time in the morning. It can be some of the best time if you need it to be, but pull out the me time in the morning, move it to the afternoon potentially, and then you buy yourself another hour here. Maybe you take a shorter lunch break. It depends on how work goes for you, uh, but try to optimize the time at home and maybe give up an hour of sleep and go for seven hours. And now you just bought two hours more back in the afternoon. What could you do with that time? Now you should use the allocations we talked about and allocate your time to something on that if you're spending it towards the boot camp. But regardless, taking the 30 hours you probably saw and wanted and breaking it down now into the 24 is a really good practice to do. All right. So that is how I teach to evaluate time right off the bat that really helps a lot of people out. And I love this lesson from my mentor because it just, it's eye-opening. I believe you guys probably saw it now, even with seeing your numbers of 30, it's like, wait, what? Yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> and then on, on kind of like a, a caveat side note here, um, Raymond says, yeah, my mentor tells me to step away, participate in, in kind of a, a sport or hobby when you get to the point of like wanting to throw that computer through the wall. Uh, agree or disagree. This takes time away from that learning and understanding. And and I think we're we're probably aligned on this here is that we never you know never want it to get to an over the point of wanting to to throw that computer through the wall. Yes, there's there's gonna be growing pains, right? It's part of that growth mindset when you're learning this new content, and it is kind of that that tighter environment. Um, but it is important to to have that self care to make sure that you know, you're setting yourself up for that long-term success, right? This isn't about just going, okay, for one day, can I make sure that I do this successfully? It's about building that into a pattern of sustainable, repeatable behavior, right? Um, yeah, and Jason, I don't know if you want to chime in there too. Uh, yeah, I think you made a really great point. I'll just add something simple uh, to Raymond's point. I totally agree. You should mm-hmm. make sure, like that's where I had in that previous slide, like you should allocate me time if you can. Uh, you should allocate family time because between the you time and the family time is what's going to keep you going. I've learned over time. It's not necessarily just friends. Like we need our friends. Yes. Um, but the friends during the week don't necessarily impact you getting to the finish line, but not having time for yourself or your family have shown to Im- over the last five years of mentoring people at thankful have shown uh, to really be like, that's where you fall off the hinges when you don't have some mm-hmm. of those other things. Right. So yes, it is good. Like I personally, uh, I, I work two different jobs and I'm building a company on the side. 
like time management is crucial for me to do anything. I make sure every Wednesday I go play basketball at night and every Thursday I go play kickball with my wife. So like I have made sure I've allocated these times in and generally it's the same time to every day, but yeah, it's very important to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like Terry says here too, you'll learn better when your mind is in the healthy state, right? It's, oh, yeah. You want to you want to make sure that uh, that you sharpen you sharpen that axe, if you will, right? If you're yeah yeah if you're given set amount of time to chop down the tree, well, you know you got to spend some time sharpening the axe to to be successful at it. <laughs> um, I agree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, even even making and that's that is like what. Just to echo what Jason was saying, yeah, it's important to to make sure that you're building that time in there too, right? That you're not just totally ignoring that piece, but that you actually have a hard, concrete way of encoding this time, of, of breaking out this time. Um, yeah, and so I guess if we, maybe we could dive into a little bit more of some of the, some of the decision for how to encode that time or where to, to dedicate that time, maybe how you're prioritizing those different pieces. You know, it's interesting when I, when I talk about this, um, uh, uh, amen, Arthur. Amen. Um, <laughs> he said, happy wife, happy life. Yes. Um, so when we talk about prioritizing, whenever I talk about this part, sometimes people look at me funny, especially like, wait, people need help prioritizing. Yes. Yes. This is a very key thing. Like if we went back to like, when you asked the question earlier about like, what's the thing that people miss as a huge catalyst, this is another thing that people miss learn like prioritizing what they truly need to get done in the very beginning through the six month boot camp, and they lose sight of some of these things and then they get a task and they just go based on what motivates them and then they run and chase down that and then they run and chase down something else and they don't stay focused and so having your priorities straight and knowing how to get them there is key and so there's a couple things i teach on this that i like to talk through is there's three things i look at for when teaching people how to prioritize is categories that you're going to focus on, like generally areas. And I'll, I'll go through four of them that would be, uh, I would say, be good for you all to follow if you're going through the boot camp or thinking about it. Uh, the second is how to rank them and then a process for kind of doing it all. And I'll show you, and this is the part of the reference sheet you'll see here in a second, uh, the Eisenhower time matrix, one of my favorite. But before we can get to that, we have to understand our categories that we're going to follow and like fall into in the buckets we stick to. And I, I go with four. And I think this goes up to the health part from before and the family part from before. Uh, but I talk about first off family is the first bucket that you stick to and dedicate when we're prioritizing. That's one of the buckets that you will categorize as high importance, specifically your significant other, your kids, your close family. And when we talk about then the second category, I like to tell people to focus on is the boot camp. is, are you learning something? Are you building something? Are you teaching something? Uh, the third category is health. Uh, the sleep, the exercise, the food you're eating is very important. And then categories around the me time is the personal time to yourself. Hygiene, yes, can be a problem. I have learned in my time. And friends, a little bit of time for friends if if you need it. Uh, like I said before, though, this that doesn't directly impact success, so I don't always teach it. But there is like I don't want people to get misconstrued. Like time on the weekends is a great time to make sure you are categorizing and prioritizing your friends. But those are the four like buckets. But we have our buckets now. And we know kind of what we're going to focus on. There's a way I teach people to rank it. I teach people to rank it for happiness and fulfillment and goals. Now, before you even have to ask this, Dodge, <laughs> I'm going to answer it. What's the difference between happiness and fulfillment? Was that going to be your question? Was about to cue that up. <laughs> I yeah. knew that was, the, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, the reason why like I put we, this it sounds in here, like we've got two similar things going on here, but yeah. Yeah. And the reason why I put this in here is because like, this is all stuff I've learned over mentoring the last five years and myself. Like I spent a long time trying to even figure out, uh, my own why for a long time. Like what, mm -hmm. why, why was I doing everything? And one of the things over teaching in this own journey for myself is that there is a distinction between fulfillment and happiness. Fulfillment is longer lasting. Happiness is temporary in the sense of you can, uh, <laughs> this is a, uh, you can love your job at the end of the year, like a social worker can love their job and their impact and be fulfilled at the end of the year, knowing what they did. But in the short term, they're not mm -hmm. happy on a day-to-day -day basis. They hate their job. They hate what they're doing. Now, 
the other the other side of the spectrum is also like you can overall be not fulfilled at something but enjoy the pace enjoy the problem solving enjoy some of the stuff on the day-to-day -day aspect but temporary happiness doesn't last it goes away at some point but we have to know there is a difference between the two of them and we have to prioritize some situations fulfillment won't be affected but happiness would be affected so it's like okay we'll be happy for a bit and it doesn't really mess with fulfillment so okay happiness is higher ranked then and the other one is goals. So we got to make sure we figure out our goals. I'm not going to go over goal setting right now, but let's be clear. If I was, let's give some examples. Generally, people tell me they want to have a great marriage or keep up with their family first and foremost. They can't drop that, which I totally agree. The second is getting a tech job out of the boot camp. And the third is something always like, I want to win a bowling league or I want to do something personal for myself. <laughs> so, so knowing that, this is where I teach the process. I'll share my screen now. Uh, when I teach the process, yeah. I like to teach that uh, you value two things, all right? You value, uh, <clears throat> you value urgency, or like in the process when you're choosing, you value what's actually urgent and physically value. I'll show you what I mean uh, through this Eisenhower uh, matrix. And this is one way I help people prioritize. And the reason why I say urgent and value is value is something I learned earlier in my career at that catalyst point we were talking about that if I was just out there to just try to do the work and to just be there and crank out code, I wasn't truly providing value. And once mm -hmm. I learned how to provide value, people couldn't say no to me anymore. People couldn't not give me a raise. People couldn't see things because I was providing so much value to their bottom line, to their bottom dollar, to whatever it was. And so I've always ever since then pushed value because if you can provide value, you, the money will come, the happiness will come. A lot of things will come when you provide value. And so when I talk about this matrix, this is kind of how I look at it. I have urgent and not urgent up top, high value and low value. Sometimes in the matrix, you'll see that people put important. I don't think important because what's important to one person isn't important mm -hmm. to another. But what's high value to your situation is generally high value to everybody. Um, but we look at when we use it, this is the Eisenhower time matrix. It was actually popularized by Stephen Covey. Uh, even though Eisenhower was a very popular person, but in his books, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, this was something he brought uh, forward that really got really popular again. And so the first cube, and this is what people call like almost like the first priority, if it has high value and urgent, you always do it right now. If it's not urgent and high value, you plan it out, put it on your schedule to get done. If it's low value and urgent, you delegate it because it's not ultimately going to move your bottom dollar, but you could potentially say, have your wife help you with something, have one of your peers help you with something, delegate to somebody else potentially if you can, or if it's low value, not urgent, remove it now or move it to a list that's like a, a, a honeydew list or a happy to do list or a list that is can be done on the weekend or done outside of the critical time that you're blocking. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the Eisenhower Matrix. I like to teach this to help people figure out how to prioritize. But let me give you an exact scenario now of like, okay, well, how do you actually use this whole category thing you're talking about and like urgent? Let, let me show you. So let's yeah. take that. We'll, we'll, bring some, we'll bring some tasks in here or some, yeah. Uh, yeah, some, some topics in here. So let's say before, this is before we categorize it. Let's say your list of, you have four things to do. Work on your JavaScript capstone. Work on practice for the bowling team because you're infatuated with bowling. <laughs> Spend some time with the family and turn in your next homework or turn in the homework for the next lesson. All valiant things that, you know, you need to get done. If you truly want to go towards your goals, these are the most urgent and high value because they go right towards your goals. So fair enough. But if we want to reorganize this into what to do first, we can start looking at what is fulfillment, what is happiness, and what is towards our goals, what matters most. Well, we know in our goals, first and foremost, our goal, number one's goal is to make sure you have a great marriage. In that sense, maybe spend time with the family is the first thing you should be doing. That's urgent. That's high value. We do that first because overall, fulfillment-wise and goal-wise, those things are absolutely urgent. And these all fall into the right categories. So we just got to look at fulfillment, happiness, and uh, goals. And so that's by far the top. But then the next turns into actually turning in your homework. Here's why. When we look at, when we look at fulfillment, there's not much fulfill, like you're not going to mess with long-term. If you don't turn your homework in long-term, that's not going to affect you. So not really about fulfillment in that sense. It's more about happiness here. And your goal is to be, uh, a get the job. Well, 
when we're looking at that goal, it's like, well, I also have work on my capstone here. Isn't that going to you know, affect the long term and affect my goals? Well, yes. But in this time now, when we look, when we compare these two, it's like, oh, happiness, which is short term, won't be affected by not getting the capstone in right away. Mm-hmm. But happiness would be sadly like it would be deeply affected if you get to class the next day and don't turn in your homework because everyone in class turned in theirs but you. So you'll be the odd man out. It won't be a good feeling. So we can avoid the deduction of happiness away (laughs) and by prioritizing it to get it done because that ultimately has a higher impact on happiness than the JavaScript capstone does. So I would say in this sense, we do next lesson first, then we work on our capstone and then we practice for the bowling team. And so that's one way to then use this and reprioritize. Am am I making sense, Dodge? Does that leave you any questions? No, and and I think uh, I think to what uh, another kind of almost related topic that this brings up is is that idea of single tasking, right? Where now that you've now that you've gotten this this structure, this framework, well, it allows you to be that much more effective on each of these pieces too, because you're not thinking about let me try to do both of these things at the same time. You go, okay, now I can be that my effectiveness on each of these is magnified even more because of this structure that I've surrounded it with. You got it. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that, sorry. I'm just giving myself and, and everybody time to, to practice with it <laughs> or to, uh, to, to, yeah, to, to ingest this here. And uh, yeah, do we have any, any questions really quick. Um, cause I know, uh, as we're kind of moving through these different tools and everything, uh, I also want to make sure that we're, we're not missing any specific questions about each of these tools. So, uh, I want to review the chat in the Q and a bar really quick, especially on this, um, this Eisenhower matrix here. Um, yeah, I guess a, a quick follow-up for that Eisenhower matrix, um, and for, for kind of structuring our time that way, when do you like to have people take a look at using that and and bringing those different tasks into there? Is it a daily thing? Is it at the beginning of the week thing where you're trying to look ahead and go, all right, maybe this is where I can start to bin some of these things? Yeah, no, that's a good point to bring up. I would say uh, I like to have, because when we talk about allocating our time, right, reviewing, mm-hmm. One of the things that kind of will lead into a thing we're going to talk about here probably in a minute, because it just naturally comes up after this, is the, is the two-hour rule. Um, but a lot of that two-hour rule revolves around reviewing somewhat. Mm-hmm. And I like to tell people to do this at the end of the week. And by the end of the week, I mean Sunday. So really the start, the end, however you want to look at it. Yeah, yeah. But really get all your stuff a, in a, a row. Book, a bookend in some way, right? Yeah. Some, some kind of that, that book ended. Yeah. Yeah, so right around there, that's about the most optimal time to do it. And then that way over the week, if something gets added to it, you don't really have to think too much because it's one thing. It's like, is it urgent? Is it high value? Really, it's a lot easier when you have it under control. Let me plug this in there. Yeah. 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 So as, okay, so you mentioned the uh, the two hour rule as part of that that review process and that kind of, um, that kind of launch for the week, end of the week. Tied tied together there. Uh, let's yeah, let's dig into that two hour rule. What are what are we talking about with that? So one of the things, and this is like a quick. This is comes from an experience I have with one of my students. Um, his name's Shay Kennedy. Uh, he's one of Thinkful's probably. He's up there. He's on their marketing material. He's one of I'd say their most successful students ever. Uh, he was one of the students I got to mentor from start to finish. Uh, very proud of him. He I, and I did an interview with him on on my YouTube channel, if you're interested watch it, very smart guy. Um, and one of the things he did better than anyone else, I wouldn't say like compared to, I've had a lot of very, very smart students that didn't always work as hard. I've had a lot of smart people in general that just didn't work that hard uh, that I've met. But there's one thing that Shay had over all of them and it, that he was willing to put in that time, the effort. Uh, and the one thing that I categorize now and call it after him, even though he didn't quote unquote, we didn't like coin this term when we were together, but now looking back at his time, um, I named the two hour rule after him because what this man did was he spent an extra two hours every day more than anyone else. And what I mean by that is he would get up an hour early if he had to, to review for the, he did two things during this extra time he always pumped out. 
He was either reviewing or preparing with these extra two hours. And this is where if you can, over the course of your boot camp, prioritize to add enough an extra two hours in. And that can be like you can this time can be used at lunch. This time can be used in the morning. This time can be used right before you go to bed to do two hours extra a day for just reviewing and preparing. That's an extra 500 hours over the course of six months. Damn. You want to reach competition. You want to be better than them. You want to set that bar that much higher for you. And that, that ceiling that much higher, finding a way to add an extra two hours a day, which is tough, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's 14 hours a week extra. If you're already doing 25, now we're talking you're at 39. Yeah, that's tough. But if you can prioritize it, if you can put it in your schedule, if you can allocate the time to it and put it in the preparing and reviewing, and you can spend this time reviewing what you've learned, if you can spend this time preparing for tomorrow, if you can spend the end of the week on Sundays reviewing for the rest of the week and preparing for next week and reviewing what you did last week, it's critical. And this is something that he did with all this, with his work ethic that he put in that I like to tell people, if you can try for it, do it because it can set you apart in the long term. Mm -hmm. And, and so is, do you think it's, it's still really possible to, to have this, find this extra two hours, um, I guess without sacrificing some of those other things to, to a detrimental degree, right. To, yeah. to, to kind of right there's we still have to have that that kind of self care that the, those different pieces how do you how do you strike that balance right yeah so here's where i like to strike to help so we we looked at that that sheet for you guys to chart your time on later i want you to go ahead and chart that time and optimize as best you can without adding in this 2 hour rule right off the bat and then i want you to look at what could you what could you do to add this in after you optimize it to the best of your general abilities with the time you have allocated, but then look at like, okay, if I got to work a half hour later or a half hour earlier, and I could take that hour lunch and eat for 15 minutes and study and review for 45, if I could study for 25 minutes right before you go to sleep, like you can find these nuggets of 20 to five, 25, 30 minutes, well, whether hour. it's at your lunch break, whether it's in the morning when you get up, whether it's you're playing a podcast of developers in the morning that's talking about what you learned last week while you're getting ready. Like there are these or while you're on that commute, right? When you're on the commute. There's lots of these little nuggets that you are already stuck in traveling time. I like to get people to re-optimize the time they already have for the two hour rule. And that prime like when I lived in Texas, oh, I read 55 books one year because my commute was an hour each way. And so I would just pop in an audio book or audio. It was audible. So I didn't pop anything in the cassette player. Too, but you that. <laughs> All right. Um, me though. But, you know, probably wishing that we could have. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that was something that I used to do when I read 55 books in a year. I, I couldn't have done that without the commute. And truthfully, I can't do it nowadays because I'm on a train. And so all those books I used to get to read don't I don't, I don't get to anymore. And so I like I kind of wish I had that time back for travel because I <laughs> it was multi-purpose for me. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's that's a. That's an awesome, an awesome like additional way to to maximize that time that you do have, right? And that that commute time, that's something that I mean, now I'm mostly remote based, so I, I don't get that as much. But at previous positions, I did have that train commute. I did have some some of that public transportation. I always try to make sure that I'm I'm knocking out a book, I'm knocking out finding those different ways to to give yourself more of your own time back that you don't realize that you're giving away. Yeah. Um, or Lorenzo says, yeah, maybe an old school Walkman. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, yeah, so it's very cool. So, I mean, we've done kind of a lot of building this foundation, right? Understanding where we need to be allocating our time, understanding how we need to evaluate and how we need to concretely assign those different bins. Um, and yeah, okay, and this is perfect. So Raymond also says, yeah, maybe this issue, feeling maybe like you're spinning the wheels a little bit, trying to increase the quality of that learning. And now that we've built up that foundation, this is where we can really launch that actual learning, right? This is uh, this is the moment you've all been waiting. I feel like I should be an announcer, like bring <laughs> yeah. the mic in. Ladies and like, this Gentlemen. is the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> In this round, we have uh, we have 
not yeah. so quality of learning and we have uh you know whatever but yeah so this raymond i think you asked the prime question at the prime time for a prime answer um so i think dodge would you say when i told you about this when we talked a while back would you say well, this was the most beneficial part to everything i had to like everything we talked about i mean at the risk of of minimizing the other stuff because like that concrete assignment building out detailing all that out that's certainly like it's mind opening and it's it's illuminating for maybe for knowing how you really sp are currently spending your time right that's that's that like little illumination piece yep. but i think this really is the piece where it's like okay then now that i know what the what like a problem is or where these shortcomings is are this is how i can this is how I can really fill those. This is how I can maximize my understanding of the shortcomings. So, so this is where it all comes full circle, ha. Huh? <laughs> Legitimately, no, full, full circle. So this is, so Raymond, to answer your question, everyone else out there, this is legit, literally, I think, the part that is the most impact I can add to your lives to not just like, this isn't just gonna add impact, like, oh, that makes sense. No, I think this can add the most impact to your life. If you guys, like, and this, this brings it back to Tara's question too, right? How to yeah. keep moving with that material and you don't have a lot of time. This is how, if you if you, if you you fell out of focus a bit, focus for this part because this next five to 10 minutes is probably the most impactful I can give you throughout this entire presentation. Yes, everything else is very beneficial and you need from a foundational perspective, but this is the part that's going to help you, I think, out the absolute most. And so what I call it is the learning circle. And this is when we're talking about you want to have quality learning and you want to be more effective when you're learning. This is what I point to on how you do it. And it changes for everyone. Everyone has their own learning circle. All right. Everyone, the process gets completed differently for everyone. And what I hate to hear, but I hear it all the time is all oh, programming isn't for everyone. You shouldn't program. And I can't stand that because that's not the truth. I mean, what it truly is, is everyone can be a, pro a programmer. What it takes is learning your learning circle, learning the pro process to learn programming effectively. Because truth be told, you Absolutely. know how the data on your phone works. You know how to make a function, right? You do it every morning, the get ready for work function, right? You get up and run the same function every morning. You take a shower, you get dressed, you eat breakfast, you drive to work. And you program this function to take different information in, like how many hours did you sleep? If you only slept five hours, you're skipping a shower, right? Because you're going to then just drive straight into work so you get an extra 30 minutes. Like you've been making decisions as a programmer your whole life. You've made conditional statements your whole life. Like, right, you get in the car, you're about to go down the road and you look at the gas tank and you instantly think, if I'm under a quarter, I'm going to the gas station because cars were not meant to be pushed. If it's above a quarter, <laughs> oh, keep driving. We got this. Like if, if your usual route has way too much construction. <laughs> Right. You, so you've been programming and problem solving and doing these types of patterns in your daily life, your whole life. Everyone can become a programmer. I truly believe it because I know when I teach everyone their learning circle and they can pick these things up, they can do it. But it doesn't come without understanding. So I'm going to teach you the process now and about the learning circle. But there's a lot of figuring out you're going to, have to do on your own and figuring out and testing what does and doesn't work here. But I believe this is the secret key that helps everybody to learn. And I'm going to show you that now. So this is what I call the learning circle. And it starts out, or the big reason why it really works is I think everyone's missing a piece to the pie. All right. And whether it's the piece on the bottom left, the piece on the top right, you'll see what I mean. There's generally something missing here. Then that's why they can't complete the full circle. And I'll tell you, uh, I got a fun story about a neurologist at Thinkful. So you'll hear about that. Um, so... When I teach the learning circle, the first part I teach is you have to go do your research ahead of time. So let's say we wanted to learn, let's say we wanted to learn about React. Now, yes, with you being in boot camp, sometimes this research is already done for you. But you'll see what I mean here in a minute. If you need supplemental content, you need supplemental information, you need to make sure you research it ahead of time. So if you're gonna go learn React, first thing I try to recommend everybody do is research everything ahead of time. Because when you start researching ahead of time, like how to learn React, you're gonna look at 10 different table of contents and you're gonna start seeing the patterns, patterns are showing up again. You're gonna start seeing the patterns of everyone thinks to seeing that components are, are stateless components 
are a great thing to learn first, or JSX HTML files are the next best thing to learn. Okay, and so you see the you see all this stuff, and you see these table of contents, and you see the topics, and then you can research those, and you can grab some extra quality articles, some tutorials that you're going to use later on, and you can do this all ahead of time. This is strategic for a reason because if you know the fifty thousand foot view of everything you have to learn, nothing is going to surprise you. You will already have researched this information. You already have sites, you will have content, you will have a bunch of things ready for you. And this helps with not going down that rabbit hole because when people get into these later phases, I'm going to teach you, they go down these rabbit holes that are like, oh, there's Google. Oh, there's Facebook. Oh, there's Twitter. Oh, what are they saying? What are they saying? And before you know it, you're off topic and not even in the right realm anymore. So I try and, to do a learning circle having this up done first. And and one one part that I hadn't even thought about, but is just occurring to me now is when you are doing that research, you're going out and you're seeing, like you said, those different patterns, even if maybe even if you don't understand what all of it is right away, you've primed your brain, right? You've seen that topic, you know that it's coming up. And then from a learning environment, from that learning perspective, once you remove that element of surprise, you'll be in a much more confident space to keep learning that topic, even if you don't fully comprehend it right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's much easier to face your fears in the light than it is the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we have our research. This is the first part. Let's move on to the second part. The second part is content. So we now have our research. We have what we know we need to do. Well, now it comes to the content phase. But this isn't just like, oh, do the content. No, this is we have to ingest the content in the most meaningful way to you because I'll tell you right now, I uh, – I don't learn by reading. I am the worst person. You give me a book, you'll never get done. You give me an audio book, that stuff will get done in two hours on <laughs> triple speed if I could. Uh, and then just to highlight like the flip side of that, I love learning from books. Like I remember during my boot camp experience, I would go out and I would find like physical books. And I was one of the only person, one of the only people in my program that did ever was like, what are you doing? This is crazy. Like, you're not going to be applying, you're not going to be writing the work that you're doing here in a book. I was like, I know, but that's part of my key for how I learn well, right? Yeah, but that's, this is where, I think to your point exactly, your learning style is what this is all about. Like I, I thought about calling this this piece of the pie, like the learning style, but it really, it's the, you got to indulge in the content, but your learning mm -hmm. style is what you have to apply here, right? Kinesthetic learner, auditory learner, uh, visual learner, what are you? Because if you're not applying it, this is one of the pieces of the puzzle that can be royally messing you up instantly every single time. Uh, prime example, uh, some some boot camps I have worked with out there teach all video-based. And some people just don't learn that way with no mm -hmm. mentors. And they need mentors. They need people. Like their learning style isn't just content and videos. It's like they need someone by their side. So knowing your learning style and really how to make it effective uh, not just the reading and watching, it's the mentors. It's it's that aspect of indulging in that content. So, And this can also present itself in tutorials, right? If tutorials help you, videos, learning, there's multiple, there's a ton of mediums that can really persist here to help you. Once you have that content, you've done your research, you've, you've read the content, you think you understand it, well, now it is time to actually build something, right? This is a great time when tutorials come to play. But this is also when it goes to the time when I talked about if you're going to spend time to work on stuff, make sure it's portfolio quality. So you got to build something that's meaningful, build something that's helpful, building something that makes you understand what you just did. And if you don't understand it, go build a different project. Go work on another edit bit problem. Build until you feel confident in what you just did. Not to the sense you feel like you had to memorize it and you'll never remember it again because you only memorized it like you're in school for the Spanish test. I remember doing that. That was not fun. But do it to the point where it feels like second nature to where it's not like I have to try so hard to memorize. It's just like, oh, yeah, for loop. Oh, yeah, a while loop. Done deal. But physically building something. So if we've gone through the process now, right, you've researched it, you've learned about it, you've now built it, you're feeling pretty confident. What's the last step? The last step is teaching. Teaching is the most I'd say skipped over step. This is that piece of the pie. And yeah, in the previous chart I did represent is this one. This is the one that people skip all the time. Mm -hmm. Fun story. I was corrected by a neurologist at Thinkful. And every time I say <laughs> it, people go, wait, why was a neurologist at a boot camp? 
Well, because he wasn't being fulfilled by his work anymore, I guess. But fun fact, I was in a meeting, I was on a Q&A helping him out with his code. And I was telling him something about this. And I used to think this was a whole left brain, right brain thing in the sense of this solidified your learning, which it does, right? People have always told you, you don't truly know something until you can teach it. Yeah, well, this neurologist corrected me. So I, now I know to tell you guys correct information. It's actually a back of the brain to the front of the brain. When you actually take your thoughts and your understandings in your own mind and convert it into language, it transfers it from different cortexes of the brain, or not even cortex, different parts of the brain from back to front. And it helps, actually helps you create these new neural networks to actually store the information from a long-term perspective. You might not remember everything short-term, but from a long-term perspective, and this is actually going to get in the knowledge guide here in a second for Tara. And for uh, and for those data scientists, those aspiring data scientists out there, because I know there's one or two hanging out there in the crowd. These are the real neural networks, not the data science neural networks that are, you know, trying to mimic that function of the brain. <laughs> yes. But here's yeah. how I say teach. And I always get this question. Probably some of you out there right now, like skeptical, of like, what am I teaching? Who am I teaching? And teaching can happen in so many different mediums. You can make a YouTube video. You can make a blog. You can teach your dog. You can teach your significant other. You can teach your peers. You can make a course. But here's the great thing about all these different mediums. And there's, there's more. You don't have to make any of them public. You can make them all private. It's the practice of taking what's in your head and putting it into language and putting it out into the world, regardless if anyone sees it. Physically doing it now creates the entire circle. Because now what we're doing is we're researching. Researching leads into, okay, I'm going to ingest the content. Ingesting and learning the content goes into building something badass. Building it goes into now teaching somebody what you just did. And then the circle repeats. So the great thing about it, when let's say we were learning React, well, we already learned JSX. Now we've already done our research. So we just pick up our couple URLs, go over to the content phase. Oh, we learned our content about stateless components. Okay, let's go build stateless components. Let's go teach stateless components. And let's go back. And so yeah. the circle repeats itself. And so if you can learn how to do your circle most effectively, this is when we're talking about, to Raymond's point, to Tara's point, when you want quality of learning, you have to figure this out. And this is why I believe anyone can learn programs because you've been a programmer your entire life. If we can figure out the secret sauce to your learning circle and figure out how you indulge in the content best, how you build things best to actually solidify and how you teach it best, oh my God, you could be you could be a developer in three months if we find out and find out the best pattern right away. Yeah. It doesn't always happen right away. This is something though, as you see this, this does take some practice. This does take understanding of what did or didn't work. This does take looking at supplemental content and say, did this or didn't this help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what and what strikes me too is that is that once once you have this, we've all been, we've been talking about this in the context of just learning, but this is something that I'm sure that you could speak to this for actual on the job being able to practice as a practitioner of that. I'm, I'm sure this is something that you can you can apply there too, right? Not just in that boot camp learning environment, right? This is this is something that anytime you're faced with that new task at work, you can you can turn to this, right? Every time. Any every time. Yes. I use this yeah. all throughout life. I love to teach this to boot camp students because it's most relevant at their time in their life right now, much like for yeah. you guys tonight. But yeah, I use this everywhere. And you can learn really fast when you know, like I know all too well how to research really freak like i would i should probably do a live session someday about i want to learn something new and show people this live because yeah, like yeah. i can research hella quick now and i know exactly what type of content i need and i can actually do like two to three times speed through videos pick out the content really quickly i can then go build what i want and then i can go teach it to anyone i want it pretty spontaneously so it, this i use all over the place it's it's one of my favorite things to teach people because i think it's the most impactful yeah, and the, the other piece that, that strikes me here too is that in so many of these different parts, they're, they're really serving you in a couple different ways, right? It's helping you not only internalize and understand that content or that whatever topic that you're trying to learn, but and then it's turning it around and because you're building something, that building, like you're saying, that, that building helps you internalize it, but it also gives you that proof for down the road, right? That you're going, okay, I've built this, check this out. This yeah. is actual proof. I know what I'm talking about. I can do, I can prove what it is that I can say I can do. Exactly. 
Yeah. And, and of course, like d applying that to, you know, after you're out of that boot camp, when you're an actual software engineer, that building, right, that's like a big crux of your work. You go, yeah, I, I've built this. This is the value that I'm bringing, going, tying it back to that value piece that you talked about at the very at the top of the session. So there's one more point to make here with this, that um, this is where I'm going to bring in that knowledge guy we talked about. And it directly ties to this is actually one of the things and I didn't really articulate the learning circle until about a couple of years ago to teach people. Um, but there's something I learned even before then that was called the knowledge guide. And it directly correlates to this. So what this is going to help you do is going to help you learn this from a long-term memory perspective. But the thing you have to understand, and yes, I was corrected by the neurologist on this too, and why I feel like I've fair enough to talk about it now, is there's only so much, and we know this, there's only so much you can keep in your short-term memory, right? There's only so much. So what I like to teach people, since this does really well at teaching you for a long-term memory, is I like to teach what I call a knowledge guide. And like, I go more in depth on it, and like where when I teach it on a larger scale, I go more in depth on it. But for the moment, let's make it really simple. A knowledge guide is basically you taking what you just learned, summarizing in your own context, in your own words, in your own summary, in probably around anywhere from five to 10 sentences. And if you need examples, fine. And you put it in a GitHub file or some type of notebook. You put it in a notebook for all I care. I generally like to tell people put it in GitHub. It's a little bit more searchable. But you take what you just learned, you summarize it up in the moment in your own thoughts. And this is where you really take this teaching point, teach it into what I call the knowledge guide, Store it there so that any given point in your short-term memory, if you ever run across JSX problems, stateless architecture, Redux architecture, and you're like, oh, crap, I don't remember Redux. Oh, my short-term memory remembers I have what I call a knowledge guide. Oh, let me go over to the section on Redux. Oh, oh, that's right. And what it is, it's a huge recall back to what you learned long-term, and it generally helps bring that long-term memory into your short-term so you can recall the stuff a lot faster. I started learning this actually when that year I learned 50, I did 55. Yeah, that's books. crazy. The year I did 55 books, I, this is when I came up with this and I was like, oh wow, I've read 20 books and I don't remember what the first one even said. Like, I don't yeah. remember a damn thing about it. And once I learned, I was, I recalled one of the memories. I was like, oh, if I put it, like, if I put this into summary, how would this work? And so I started putting stuff, like I would summarize the books and now I can go back to my knowledge guide at any point and look at the book summary and go, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what it's about. And I bring yeah. that memory back into short term. And this learning circle with the knowledge guide pairs itself. Pa really past, well. past you has like invested in future you's memory, right? Like that's, that's exactly it. That, that's like, yeah. That, that, no, that's, that's awesome. It's like you, Jason looking out for Jason, you know? <laughs> No, that's, that's, right. Um, yeah. but yeah, so that's so what did that leave did that leave us with any questions, Doctor? I imagine so like between the knowledge guide and that, um those are I get a lot of questions around. Was there any questions or anything on that or did did I make sense better yet? No, yeah, yeah. I think I mean this this was awesome, incredibly illuminating. And the, even for me being a mentor and and having gone through that boot camp process, like I find myself taking away so many different pieces of this too that I'm like, oh yes, this would be perfect to to bring to to my different students that I work with. Um, yeah, and I guess kind of as we're, I just I was looking at the time, and as we're starting to kind of look towards the end of our session here, um, I definitely want to make sure that we're we're getting into any of those questions that are out there. So for everybody who's who's at this point. Um, yeah, definitely feel free to, to keep asking those questions uh, in the chat or the Q&A. If you do ask it in the chat, I might bump it over to the Q&A just so we have it all aggregated there. Um, but yeah, let's let's actually dig into to some of these ones that are hanging out out there um, before we before we start trying to wrap up here. Um, so awesome. So and then, uh, yeah, as you're, as you're grabbing that first question, um, one of the things that I get, and I think I said earlier, I think we put it in, but I'm just going to put it in there. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I have a more feeling I'm already going to assume I, I generally get an email on this a session. So <laughs> I'm just going to address that now. If you want to connect with me, go ahead and connect with me. I highly encourage it. Awesome. Yeah. And, and 
likewise with me. I don't think I'll have as many connections as, as you after this, but <laughs> but yeah, I've got that that information there in the chat as well. Um, very cool. So a, uh, a question from a fellow Jason out there. Uh, how did you decide which path to choose within uh, kind of the overall tech community? For example, Jason went uh, software development, software engineering route, and Dodge went with more of the data route. Um, yeah, it's a pretty pretty big, broad question, but but definitely a, a a valid, worthwhile one as you're starting to explore kind of overall if you're thinking about making that career transition, that career change. Um, and then J I guess we, we can each take a part of ours and, sure. and talk about maybe what interested us there, and then some high level questions that that you can be asking yourself to to start guiding your process. I'll make my answer quick so we can keep going on to other ones. Um, mm -hmm. My answer to that is I just knew I, I liked problem solving. I knew I liked code. I knew I wanted to solve stuff with it. And more later on in my career, I'm still uh, I'm still developing heavily right now, but I'm slowly getting off that and much more in a management role, like slowly weaning off development. And that's because I like people. You guys probably see based on tonight, I've got a passion for processes, helping people, mentoring people. And so I, I'm, I'm transitioning that way. But overall, I'm a, I'm a problem solver at the end of the day. Yeah, and then for me on the on the data side, um, I had a little bit of statistics experience or statistics background. Uh, I had really enjoyed that piece of it, um, and just kind of learning how to to formalize that, build it out in a larger sense, and just knowing kind of the outsized impact that you could start to have as one of those data practitioners, knowing in that decision making process, uh, that was something that that really appealed to me. Um, but yeah, I, I guess for yourself, there's, there's a lot of different questions, um, that need to be asked out there. Uh, but so for that piece, a little bit beyond what we have time to dig into. So please, please connect with us on, on LinkedIn. Um, that's definitely a conversation that, uh, happy to, to continue there. Um, nice. So our next upvoted one comes from Ben. Uh, as a career coach with Thinkful, what are some of the common challenges that graduates of Thinkful face when trying to land the job? Uh, and for this one, I'd like to kind of actually expand it and open it up even more, um, even just beyond Thinkful for kind of as a new graduate or somebody breaking into that field, some of those couple things that you can do maybe beyond challenges, but that you can do to really set yourself up for success. It's, <laughs> Long story short, that's why I made that side business I have now that we talked about that I was doing was because a majority of all boot camps stink at career services in general. Like, sorry if you're in a different boot camp, they're bad. A lot of them are bad at career services. Thinkful's career services department is absolutely fantastic. Um, but I, I made that because a lot of these boot camps just don't know how to do it. And they, they let these students fall through the cracks with a lot of, oh man, that's, that's, that's a very, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. If I had to pick out, um, people fall flat on their face all the time with not knowing how to network properly, not knowing how to build connections in groups. Um, and that's actually one of the things I'm trying to help out with that LinkedIn group he sent earlier. I'm trying to people help people network and learn some of that. Like, but they don't network very well for one. Uh, two, they didn't build a very good portfolio. Uh, three, they don't actually know how to interview. Uh, I probably could just keep going down the list, but I would start with people fall flat on their face with not networking properly because the majority of all jobs, you actually go look at some of the courts studies that have been done recently. A majority of all jobs right now, like out of the 80% of out of the people that apply on like cold on job boards, only like 5% of them get the jobs out of the people that network and find jobs out of the 20% that end up doing it just right. Get 20% of the, like get the actual 20 jobs. I don't, I don't think it was percentage based. But basically, for the people who apply there, get the jobs. Like it's a huge discrepancy. If you don't know how to network, we're talking you're going to get like five percent callback rate and a one percent job offer rate out of the thousand jobs you apply for. And so mm -hmm. that's awful numbers. And networking can solve that pretty damn a lot quicker over time. Yeah. Uh, but I would go with networking. There, there's so much more there to unpack. <laughs> there's a lot, and I think one for me that jumps out there um, is. And like Jason was saying, um, I've or I may have forgotten to mention it earlier, but 
uh, yeah, the, the teaching that I've done in data science and machine learning, it's been with a number of different organizations. So I've kind of gotten to see those different pieces across the board. Um, and at least on the data science side, a big challenge that, um, that people have when they're going out into the field is tied in with that communication piece that's really important to networking is also being able to articulate and understand the value of where you fit into a team or where you fit into a company, right? Being able to, and like Jason said, tying it back to that value, being able to talk to various stakeholders about the work that you're doing, including people that are up higher than you, being able to answer those different questions, being able to really talk about your workflow in a coherent way. Um, that's, that's kind of one of the pieces that jumps out to me, but is again, a lot, a whole lot there to unpack. Uh, but yeah, Ben, hopefully that gives some, some good, at least starting points and some additional context there. Um, whew, another one that a lot to unpack. Can you talk more in depth about why uh, university failed you technically? Um, yeah, yeah, this comes from Ugona there in the, uh, the Q&A bar. So you didn't go to Marietta College, right? Let me just make this clear before I answer. I'm just kidding. Um, you're not like a Marietta spy, are you? Uh, you know, no, I'm kidding. Um, so I think they, like, I loved my professor. Don't get me wrong. They were great. And they did teach me how to Google really well. But where I think they failed me technically is they thought that learning a piece about everything was great instead of focusing on, like, programming. Like, we had to only take programming 101 and 201. Uh and then they, even then they told us, taught, they taught us a bunch of random languages, taught us bits and pieces, never fully getting, like they went from one year we went to Python, the next year we went to Java, the next year we went to .NET. And like one year, half, like not even fully doing a crazy ton of projects and not really packing enough in, didn't mm -hmm. really teach me. And then by my junior and senior year, all they wanted to do was theory, theory about how networks work and typology works and theory about how security works and like no actual implementation. So like in the learning circle, I only got to research and content. I never actually got to really build anything and then teach anything. So like I never fully completed the circle and my, and it was evident when I got to fidelity that I never did complete the circle. <laughs> yeah. And, and another kind of piece that jumps out just from what you were talking about there is tying back to that, that self teaching and that self learning piece. Um, and I get a lot of questions about that in other workshops and webinars that I teach. And that self-teaching, that learn, self-learning piece is really important. Like uh, before you get into a boot camp or before you do anything, it gives you that exposure to see if this is something that you really want to continue to pursue. And it gives you that good level of learning to, to, as a foundation. But there is kind of that limit to what the self-learning and self-teaching can do, at least from what I've seen people who go through that, right? Where they're, you're picking and choosing these different languages or these different frameworks or these different tutorials. And by itself, it's not bad to get exposed to those things. But really, if you want to be successful, you need to bring all of that together in that more uniform, structured way. Um, and that, that learning circle is definitely like a fantastic way to, to do that. Um, and, and those bootcamp environments can provide that more structured, um, that more structured environment. A um, couple quick ones here, and I know we're wrapping up. We're just over our schedule time, but I do want to make sure that we um, that we acknowledge these at least. Um, and if for some of them, if it makes more sense to continue the conversation on LinkedIn or email, uh, we'll also we'll also do that as well. Um, it's a quick one here from David, someone who's done front end development. Uh, I've tried to learn full stack on my own. Struggled to produce usable apps to put in my portfolio. Um, would a bootcamp help me get over that hump? also learn how to work collaborative, collaboratively as part of a dev team. Yes. So, gotcha. Um, so, like, I'm going to put this in perspective of Thinkful. Yes, it will. It, if we talk about the engineering flex, it'll help you, but you won't get to collaborate as much. You'll have to really be good at networking because the engineering flex at Thinkful is on your own time. You build out. They'll teach you all the things needed to build out these full stack applications that are actually going to be usable, that are actually good portfolio pieces. But the one thing you won't gain from the flex is like, they're not going to mandate you sit down with people and pair program. In the engineering immersion program at Thinkful, which is much more eight hours a day, much more hands-on, there's a lot there. That program would be perfect for getting you over the hump there because they actually said you have teachings in the morning. You have to pair a program with a partner in the afternoon. And then ultimately when you work on capstone projects, there's four to five of you working together with the coaches and TAs making sure you stay in the guardrails to get to the completion of the project 
which will ultimately teach you what you would be doing on a dev team. And so, yeah, that's where the engineer immersion program would be most impactful to help you learn exactly what it sounds like you need to learn. Yeah. Um, and just kind of on a, on a note on that piece too, um, I shared again that reference sheet link in the chat. And if you want more information about any of those different pieces, um, let me also go ahead and share just so you can see where I'm looking at here. So if you're looking at this reference sheet and let me go from here. Uh, so if you go all the way down to the bottom and you may be thinking uh, that you would like to, to continue learning in this space, and maybe continue learning with Thinkful. Um, we've got a whole bunch of resources down here. So uh, application link, info link about the Flex course, application info link about the immersion course. You can always grab some time with one of our admissions advisors, experts in all of our programs, as well as local markets, so they can talk about openings in your city. Um, I encourage you to grab some time in that two-week trial. Uh, it gives you a great sense of the content and the structure of the program. And then we've also got additional Thinkful webinars here. So if you want to grab some hands-on interactive time uh, with one of our workshop or webinar instructors going through those actual um, going through those actual different examples, that's a great way to do that. Uh, let me go ahead, stop sharing my screen there. Um, and then on that kind of additional webinars note, I do have a link for our next info session, our next uh, becoming a web developer info session. Um, and I'll link that right there in the chat as well. Um, awesome, so I know we are getting real tight on time here and we're actually kind of eight minutes over our scheduled time. So let me take a quick look. Do you want me to speed round these three questions I see? Let's, yeah, let's do it. And then for those, uh, for these three questions that are here, we are gonna kind of go through them quickly. Um, and if you want more clarification, please, please connect with us. We're, we're always happy to continue those conversations. Um, so so yeah. let's go down, Raymond. I'll go, I'll just go top down. We'll make sure I get to all you. So as a mentor, what would you like to see from mentees that helps them? Uh, I actually am doing videos on it. This actually next week coming out. So pay attention to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Um, but what would help mentees the most that they don't do is preparing an agenda, taking notes during their sessions, and then sending out uh, a, a kind of like a recap at the end so we're all on the same page of knowing what we need to get done, actionable items for you and for me. And you do things like that, that will help them out the most because that's when you start pushing me to do better for you. That's when you start pushing yourself to do better for yourself. That's when you start getting the most out of a session because when you come in, all that you have to focus on, there's no pleasantries. It's no, here's what we gotta get done today. Let's do it right now. Yep, and just a speed echo on that. That's one of the first things that I do with uh, with my students, as I say, to get the most out of our session time, uh, I want you to come with specific questions before that session. Um, and we usually have a shared place that we host those. That way I can see those specific questions. We can maximize that time that we're spending together. So Arthur's question, with the most job postings, recruiters are asking for three or more years. Okay. so. Um, I'm going to make this really clear really quickly. I have a five-year rule. If it's anything under five years, you apply to it. There's a couple of reasons why. I won't go crazy digging into them. But so people say three years because HR reps are always going to put the most perfect, pristine person that is never actually out there. Because let's be honest, if someone's applying for a junior role and they have three years of experience, they're stupid. No, I'm just kidding. I don't mean to say right. that anyway. But like, let's be honest. If they have there's, three, there's, three, some, there's, three, some, there's some red flags or something, yeah, right? They yeah, yeah, yeah. Over -roll, making 20,000 more. Like they put these crazy things out. And this is HR. They always do it. I always hate it. Even when I try to put my own out, they're like, no, no, we want to up your numbers. Like I won't attract anyone. We end up attracting people anyway, but we always attract low. Like it happens. So if it's anything under five years, five year rule, just apply. It just happens. It's HR. I hate that part. You got anything on that? Uh, no, yeah, it's it's a similar thing, right? This is an ideal or a, a, I guess a, some, yeah, yeah, some dream candidate out there. But the big piece there is it ties back to that building, ties back to that portfolio. If you yeah. can prove that you can solve those problems that that potential employer wants solved, working with those tools, those languages, those frameworks that that team works in, you're a competitive applicant in the space. That's yeah. building out that body of work is enough to get your foot in the door. From there, they can objectively verify. They can ask you questions in that technical interview. They can see if you really know what you're talking about. 
So it sounds like data science is a wide spectrum. I find myself wandering away from just learning Python and wanting to learn other parts of IT as well. Not really sure what actually is the most crucial stuff to focus on. Um, let me give you this. Uh, definitely dodge, I'll pass to you here in a second. Uh, what it sounds like for one, worth talking to an advisor counselor, uh, one of our mm -hmm. advisor counselor for like These are the type of questions they get all the time. You were not the first, you will not be the last, James. Uh, I think it's worth just chatting with them. It's totally free. You can just have a chat. You're not obligated to any, anything at all. Like just have a conversation with them. What I would say is figure out what you like, what would be the ideal job that you'd want to show up at tomorrow? Go find some of those jobs on the job boards and start breaking down what they're asking for. And if you realize the stuff you want to do is all predicated towards data science, then figure out the language, figure out the topics, figure out the specialty you want to be in, whether it's NLP or big data. I'll pass it over to Dodge now. Yeah, yeah. And and um, yeah, the other parts of, of IT, uh, yeah. And we start wanting to, to kind of parse these out and make sure that we're defining things in the right way. like. For IT, is that really the overall tech field at large? And if that's the case, then it comes back to some of those questions, right? What is it that I want to be doing in my day to day? Do I want to be digging through data and finding trends and patterns and focusing on reporting those? Well, maybe that data analytics piece is a little bit better track. Do I want to be working with a programming language like Python, building these predictive models? Um, maybe that's more of the data science side. Do I want to? be building actual things that people are interacting with and maybe more of the, the part that they see that they click on, the front end software engineering or the frameworks that support those, the back end or full stack. Um, it's kind of starting to ask some of those questions. Uh, and like, like Jason said, definitely grab, grab some time with um, one of those admissions advisors. This is one of those things that they're amazing at, at talking through it, at answering. Um, and that link again is just at the bottom of the reference sheet there. Um, awesome. I, we are over time here, so I want to respect everybody's time out there, and I want to respect Jason's time here. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up our session for tonight. Uh, one last thing I will put here in the chat is a quick feedback form. Uh, this is by no means mandatory, but we're always looking for ways. If you got some value from tonight, we would love to understand if you got value, because that helps us to make sure we're creating, creating great speaker series events. Totally, totally. We're always looking for ways to improve everything that we're doing here. A huge part of the way that we do that is listening to people who, who come to these. Um, so if you've got a couple extra minutes, love to hear your thoughts there. Um, but yeah, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up our session time for tonight. If you have any extra questions after we wrap up, reach out to either one of us, reach out to an admissions advisor. I'm thrilled to keep that conversation going. Um, but yeah, with that, I uh, want to give a big thanks to everybody for joining us. You know you had all kinds of different things, different ways that you could have been spending your time now that we've talked about time so much. Um, but I'm thrilled that you spent it here with us. And big tip of the hat uh, for asking those questions, being just an awesome, friendly group, starting those different discussions, um, and keeping that depth of conversation really, really fantastic. So first, my first big thanks goes out to, to you there. Uh, my next big thanks goes out to Jason for taking some time out of uh, out of his day, out of his evening here to to share all of these insights, all of this this really valuable information with us. Um, and I know we're seeing it reflected there in the chat, but we all really appreciate your time, Jason. So thanks for being our uh, our our special guest speaker for 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 the session here. You're welcome. I'm honored, and I thank you all for. I, I don't take it for granted. I say this all the time when I do webinars, but I truly mean it. I appreciate you guys willing, especially now it's an hour and 45. Like I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to actually spend it with us. Uh, it means we're, we're talking about things that help people, which means we're on the right path. So that makes me happy. So thank you for spending the time with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Uh, well, with that, we're gonna go ahead and cut things short here, or <laughs> rather cut things long <laughs> since we ran out over time. Uh, but yeah, we are gonna wrap things up. This has been Thinkful's webinar, uh, four principles, four ways to learn to code fast. Uh, thank you all for joining. I hope you have a great rest of your day, a great rest of the week ahead, and I hope to see you guys all out there real soon. But uh, signing off, thank you guys, and have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs>